Our world is facing rapidly growing and rapidly mutating forms of extremisms, ideologies that are far left, far right, nationalistic, authoritarian, and sometimes not far away enough, knocking at our doorsteps. The question is, what do we do about these ideological extremisms? How do we battle them, not only collectively, but individually within our lives? How do we move away from ideologies that bind us and blind us to the realities of what we could be and that make us less free? Ideologies try to insist that we're all the same, that we're all indistinguishable, because if we're all the same, we can all be controlled, coerced, manipulated. But in fact, we're not all the same. Not all brains will bend. Not everybody will be equally susceptible to the allure of ideological rhetoric. My research looks at individual differences, at what makes us different from one another. And how do our psychological differences crystallize into ideological differences? How does it make some people have an ideological brain? Who has an ideological brain? Do you? Stalin once said that ideological rhetoric grips us like a tentacle, seizing us from all sides and holding us in its grip by the irresistible logic that it provides. In that way, ideological thinking has always been used by totalitarian leaders, by authoritarian regimes, in order to try to force the complexities of human experience into neat categories that are neater than reality truly is. There are two properties of our brains that make them particularly susceptible to extreme ideological narratives. The first is that our brain is fundamentally predictive. It tries to explain the past, it tries to anticipate the future so that we can behave, so that we know what to think, how to act, how to interact with others. And ideologies are these delicious solutions to the problems of how to predict the future and explain the past. Our brains are also fundamentally communicative. Not only do they want to understand the world, they also want to be understood. Ideologies also offer us solution to the problem of belonging, to the problems of communication, giving us a common vocabulary, a common language we can speak to understand each other, to coordinate behavior, but ultimately also to regulate each other, to discipline ourselves, and to therefore regulate the societies that we live in. My research uses methods from cognitive science, psychology, and neuroscience. I invite hundreds and thousands of participants to complete neuropsychological tasks where they are, enter a kind of digital playground, moving shapes on a screen, listening to sounds, trying to solve all kinds of puzzles. And from the way that they solve these puzzles, I can get a sense of how their minds work, how their minds process information, how their minds make decisions, even in neutral contexts where we're only thinking about visual shapes or linguistic games. One way to test people's cognitive rigidity is to get them to enter this game and to learn a particular rule, a rule that gives them points and rewards. They start to play the game, they pick up on the rule, and they apply it again and again until it becomes like a habit. And then, unbeknownst to them, the rule that governs the game changes. And what, as a scientist, I'm interested in is the moment of change. Some individuals will adapt these cognitively flexible people will be happy to adapt to the changing rules, to the changing environments, and they will adapt to their behavior in return. What happens for some people is that when they encounter change, they rigidify, they hate the change. They want it to go back to the old rule and they can't seem to adapt to the new rules that govern the game. We see that individuals who are more cognitively rigid tend to gravitate towards the extremes, whether that's the extreme right or the extreme left we see that they tend to possess more extreme beliefs with regards to nationalism, to with religion, are more willing to endorse violence, even to self-sacrifice in the name of an ideological group or cause. Through this research, we're able to map out the cognitive vulnerabilities and emotional susceptibilities that people have towards ideologically extreme groups. The reason that that can be both useful and dangerous is because on one hand, we can find ways to support people who are more vulnerable, to steer them away from toxic ideologies and towards more authentic, more balanced ways of living. But we need to be wary of what such assessment can do 
And we need to remember how to separate science and politics, how to make sure that these tools aren't used by malicious agents in order to stigmatize anyone. The purpose of this research is to go beyond what usual assessment does, which is relying on demographics, and instead look at the psychology so that we can treat each individual with a compassion, with the understanding that they need in order to nurture the most authentic ways of living.